Hello everyone, um, good evening and uh, thank you for joining us this evening. I am really, really excited um, about this talk. Um, it is, for those of you who don't know, we have uh, quite a few students here, I say I recognise some of the names. So hello to my students, but hello to every student here, you're most welcome. And um, hello to members of the Inn as well. And also a special hello to any of the members of the Historical Society. It's lovely to see you all on here. Um, my name is Lynn Townley. I am uh, the chair of the Middle Temple Historical Society. And again, for those of you who don't know, we have uh, round about four meetings a year. We, um, we have an interest in the history of the inn, but also we're now looking at things that intersect um, law and wider uh, social movements as well. We've been extremely fortunate this evening um, to secure uh, a Dr. Onieke Nubia, um, who was actually um, a choice of the late Master Mitchell, um, our late chair of Middle Temple. Those of you will be aware that Master Mitchell had a great interest himself in black history and was one of the pioneers to bring black history um, into the inn and into the society. Um, Dr Nubia has been long, long awaited and we're so excited um, to have him here this evening. Unfortunately, due to the pandemic, he was due to be with us back on the 20th of January of 2021. And unfortunately, we, uh, we had to postpone that due to what was going on. But since then, the Historical Society, despite its name, has come uh, racing into the 21st century. And um, very fortunately, because we've always wanted to encourage students to be interested in the society and in the history of the inn, but we've now got a very, very healthy uh, following of Middle Temple students. So if anyone is interested in joining the society or coming to the future events, um, all the details are held in the Treasury and they're also published um, online under the Middle Temple events. But we've got a really exciting programme uh, coming up over the next year and Dr Nubia is the first of many uh, world-class academics that we have coming in to talk about a lot of diverse subjects but those that you find at the intersection um, of law, history and social sciences and the likes. Black history is extremely important. We ha still have a bar um, in uh, England and Wales that is underrepresented of um, BAME uh, people. We still have a lot to do and uh, these events are extremely important um, around about making everyone feel included and uh, moving the in forward and indeed acknowledging the role that people of colour have had in the inn over the years and in wider society. So if I come to uh, introducing uh, Dr Nubia himself, um, you will have a chance to, uh, to ask questions, but it's over the chat function. So could I just ask if, if you think of a question during the course of the lecture, which will be um, around about 45 to 50 minutes, and then depending on the number of questions, um, there is, we'll, we'll go on a bit longer, but we won't, we won't exceed 8.30, we may finish a bit before. But when you think of a question, could I ask you please to populate it in the chat um, as soon as you think of it and not kind of all leave it uh, to the end of the talk. Because uh, then what happens is that a vast number of questions come in all at once and it's actually, um, it can be quite difficult to get them all fitted in. So if you could populate as we go along. So um, uh, Dr. Onyeke Nubia, um, he uh, is at the moment attached to the University of Nottingham, but he's also a visiting research fellow at both Edgehill and Huddersfield uh, universities. So what he's talking to us today about um, is research that he has done um, looking at, at, at time and space through a new lens, through an updated lens, which is what a speciality is. This is on the Tudor period. And uh, the research that Dr. Nubia has done 
um, shows how the Tudors from many walks of life regularly interacted with people of African descent, both in London and indeed uh, elsewhere. And that the ideas that um, are often associated with modern racism are in fact um, shown by Dr. Nubia's, Nubia's research to be fairly recent um, developments. So in respect of uh, Dr. Nubia's uh, general research on what he specialises in, um, now he has been described by others, not by himself, because I'm not saying this to embarrass him, but he's pioneering and an internationally recognised historian. He has reinvented perceptions of, amongst many other things, black history. He's a leading historian on the status and origins of Africans in uh, pre-colonial England um, from antiquity to the 1603 period. And a couple of books he's written, if you look on his um, biography, he's written a number of books and articles over the years. Um, but uh, most recent ones, Black British History, New Perspectives, um, published by Z Books in 2019. And uh, the latest book uh, was published uh, this year, um, What is History Now? Seeing Tudor England um, More Clearly. So, um, Dr. Nubia, um, if I could warmly welcome you um, on behalf of Middle Temple and in particular, um, all our students and members of the Historical Society who are here this evening, you're most welcome to the inn and um, we are very, very excited and interested to hear um, your lecture this evening. So over to you, Dr. Nubia. So, so hello, good morning, good afternoon or good evening, whenever you have access to this. It's uh, great to be with you. I'm going to try and share my screen with you. Hopefully it works. Uh, it seems to be. Let me just have a look. Can you all see my screen? Let me just see. Yes, we can, Dr. Nubia. All Excellent. good. <laughs> Fantastic. Good. Good. So um, I thought that we would begin with some ideas or some concepts. Um, whenever we are looking at history, there should be a distinction made between the evidence that exists that narratives are developed from and our emotional attachment to moments of history. History is in many ways all of that, both the evidence and the narrative attached to that evidence and also our emotional attachment um, to a narrative in history. The emotional attachment that we have to a narrative in history doesn't have to be based on any kind of evidence because it's emotion and emotion is not necessarily based on evidence but nevertheless for those people that have it an emotional aspect is an integral part for how we read history so today what i will be tackling is not only the evidence and the narrative attached to that evidence but also attempting to deconstruct any emotional attachment that you have to a moment in history and trying to decolonize or deconstruct um, or repopulate uh, moments from uh, moments of your emotional attachment or moments of uh, narrative that may be linked to an emotional attachment to this period of time. So I, I begin with um, this image of the present monarch, Queen Elizabeth II. Um, when we look at this image, uh, this image is a very good portrayal of that monarch. It shows her resplendent at the moment of her coronation. Of course, it's staged. But we would never presume to think that this image is the definitive image of the period of which she was the monarch. We would only say that this is an image of the reigning monarch during the latter part of the 20th and the early part of the 21st century. We would never say that this image provides us with evidence of the ethnic composition, the religious composition, the political nature, the social nature, the cultural nature of late 20th century 
21st century Britain. No, we would say that this is an image of the monarch. Now, the monarch is photographed and talked about more often, perhaps, than most ordinary people are. So there can be a bias towards thinking that the people that are often pictured, the people that are often talked about, provide the definitive explanation of those people's history. They don't. This is an image of the monarch and it should be taken as such. And with a similar kind of reflective ambivalence, should we say, we ought to also look at other periods of time in the same way and not with a purely um, uh, um, uh, narrow mind, a myopic mind, think that the image of the monarchs of the Tudor period provide a definitive definition of the ethnicity, culture, politics, or the social interactions of the people that lived in England any more than this photograph does of us. So if one fails to sort of take on um, uh, uh, these sorts of notions, one can become attached to either consciously or subconsciously a notion that English history has sacred white spaces in it. These are spaces that um, people of colour don't operate in. And if there are people of colour in those spaces, they are the other, the stranger, automatically enslaved, inferior, interlopers, aliens, always um, suffering at the hands of racial discrimination, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that would be the kind of notion that we may have if we think that there are sacred white spaces within English history. Spaces where there were not people of colour, spaces where people of African or Asian descent or other ethnicities weren't visibly present um, or even invisibly present. And we might conclude, therefore, with this kind of notion that England was essentially mono-ethnically white. This idea isn't just an idea held by people who haven't got intellectual learning. There are many people with intellectual learning who have these sorts of ideas. And there are many people like me, historians, who have these sorts of ideas. There are also many historians of color, that's people of African or Asian descent, including African Americans, who write copious books in which they state this very thing. There are Marxist historians who state this idea. Um, that there are historians of many different political persuasions. This isn't a political, this isn't a matter of politics. Uh, it is a matter of the fact that the historical academy has a narrative. And this narrative, either emotionally um, or actually, creates this idea, illusion, that there are sacred white spaces in, in English um, stroke British history. Moreover, the way in which these moments, i.e. the period from 1485 to 1603 and the early part of the Stuart period, 1603 to the 1660s, which, is, which are the periods that we're going to be looking at, when these periods are fictionalized in TV and film and, and what have you, they tend to be fictionalized also as sacred white spaces. And those um, uh, programs which are not fictionalized in that way are often called um, or demeaned as being politically correct, woke, etc., etc., with the idea that in fact the reality was that this was a, a, a white space and it's only been populated for political reasons. That would tend to be the idea that people have. Of course, terms like white and black, though we may think that they were used in exactly the same way as we use them now to describe exactly the same people that we would think that we describe, and that we might presume that if you go back in time, the way that terminology and uh, words were used is the same way that it's used now. But as lawyers, you know 
if you read those old transcripts written in the 16th, 15th, 14th century, you know if you read Magna Carta, you know if you read the 1689 Bill of Rights, you know if you read Habeas Corpus 1672, you know if you read those texts, which are considered foundational texts in the development of rights in this country, or were always considered to be as such, that these foundational texts are written in a language which is very different. Now, there is a link between that language and our language. Undoubtedly, there is a link. And if we work very hard contextually, we can work out what these words and terminologies mean. But we should not presume that the terminology is the same, because it's not always the same. It often has a slightly different meaning. Our definitions of race and ethnicity are inherited as a legacy of biological determinism and the science of race. People like Carl Linnaeus, Johann Frederick Blumenbach, uh, Charles White, um, um, these types of people have developed the idea of the science of race. And though we may reject the science and say that race is a socially constructed phenomenon, we live in the legacies of those sciences, of the science of race. We live in the legacy of it. And that's why we say and we use terms such as white to describe particular ethnic groups. In fact, we use all the colors, white, red, yellow, and black. Those colors do not describe skin color. White doesn't describe a skin color. Black doesn't describe a skin color. Red surely doesn't describe a skin color. And yellow doesn't describe a skin color. These terminologies come from the, bio, from the science of race, from biological determinism um, uh, by Francis Galton and these types of people. That's where we get this terminology, um, uh, Carl Linnaeus, etc. We get this terminology from that. When we look back in time, we find that during the Tudor period, though they may use black, and though black is more than often being used to describe people of African descent, they have other terms that they use to describe those people. And they have other terms often to describe what, me, what we might now call white. And it is entirely natural that they should, even if we look at the way in which terminologies regarding people of African descent have changed. 70 years ago, the term colored was thought an entirely respectable word to use to refer to people of African descent. So was the N-word, the word Negro, considered a perfectly acceptable word to describe people of African descent. We wouldn't think that now. And that's over 70 years ago. If we go back 400 years, we must expect that the language has changed accordingly. And so it has. So some of the terminologies that I'm going to use may seem offensive to you, or may seem anachronistic to you, but let's remember that they're coming from the time period in the period of time in question. So conceptually, what, what, what I um, also would like us to think about, because this period, the Tudor period and the early Stuart period, sits within another period called the Renaissance. And I think that many of the ideas that we have about the Renaissance affects how we see the Tudor and the Stuart period. We may think that the Renaissance is an entirely monoethnic um, uh, experience, a monoethnic experience um, typified by the artwork and science and the, and, and the burgeoning development of Renaissance technology, Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo and, and, and Raphael and all these types of artists, painters and, and, and drawers, most of them men, and most of them drawn from the upper or the middle classes within Southern European society. Um, painters and, and um, artists and uh, intellectual thinkers like Machiavelli, um, uh, Castigliani, and these types of people. This may be how we think the Renaissance is populated. And we might think that there's no space for Africans in that Renaissance. We would be wrong. Just how we have images, um, such as the Mona Lisa, we have this fantastic image. Um, this is a fantastic image uh, is of an African woman. Uh, this African woman was a servant um, to the uh, Portugal's, um, the ambassador within Portugal, um, working uh, in Holland uh, and Belgium. So this is an African woman by the name of Catarina. She was 21 years old 
when this silver point drawing was done by Albert Dürer. How do we know she was 21? Because the title of the silver point drawing is Katarina, aged 21. It was created in 1521 or thereabouts, um, and it was drawn in Europe by a European of an African woman. Uh, this image is as much a part of the Renaissance as the Mona Lisa. And these other images that I'm going to show you are also as much a part of the topography, pictography, artistry, and the imagination of the Renaissance as the Leonardo's um, uh, David or uh, Michelangelo's David or whatever um, the, the statues or, or paintings are. Okay, great. Um, uh, so that, that's the inscription of the, um, uh, to do with Caterina. Now, this, this next um, uh, painting or, or drawing, should I say, is of a number of Renaissance painters. Yeah, all six of them are Renaissance painters. And as, we, as you look down um, the picture, perhaps if you start at the top and you work your way down, you will notice that one of the six is a man of African descent, unequivocally a man of African descent. His name is Hegemant Indiana. Hedgemont Indiana was a famous Renaissance painter. A famous Renaissance painter, as in fact were a number of, of, of artists and painters of color who were part of the Renaissance. But Hedgemont Indiana has been remarkably forgotten in terms of his artwork um, and the works that he's done. But if you do a little bit of research, and I do ask that you do after this, you will find the paintings that Hegemont Indiana has painted. And they are as much a part of that burgeoning development of European intellectual um, aestheticism that we associate with um, the likes of Michelangelo and, and what have you. He was part of that, as indeed were many other people of African descent. Please let us note that he is not in any way exceptionalized in this representation. Some people might suggest that the word Indiana suggests something else. Perhaps it does. But the point is that he is included. This isn't a separate <laughs> representation for him uh, kept to one side. No, he is included along with the other masters of his field. Yes. So um, uh, I move on a, a bit because I, I just want to put these sort of reference points in your minds to interact with perhaps other reference points that you may have. This is a, um, a drawing stroke painting um, of Moors in Spain, uh, in Iberia in Spain. Um, uh, when perhaps you, you think of who the Moors were, uh, you may be thinking that the word Moor relates to religion. And it may do in some cases, but it doesn't have to. Uh, the word more, of course, comes from two words, the Greek word and the Latin word, uh, moros and moro. Both, in both cases, these words mean black. And the blackness in this case is a reference to people of African descent. So instead of using the word black to describe those people, they use the word more, which is their word of describing the complexion or the ethnicity related to the complexion of people of African descent. As I said, the terminology that people use in the past is often not the same, but is sometimes relatable. So the word more in its true sense, as used in the Iberian Peninsula, as used in parts of Southern Europe, and indeed, as it was used in England in the 15th and the 16th century, was a word that described people of African descent, not per se religion. And we're going to later explain that in more detail. OK, where somebody didn't have the rich complexion of being menelated, they were described as white moors or tawny moors if they were brown of complexion if their complexion was was a lighter brown complexion if their complexion was darker they were sometimes or more often called blacker moors that's why the title of my book is called blacker moors africans in tudoring because it's focusing on that 
population primarily, but acknowledging the fact that there are or were Tawny Moors and White Moors. But the word Moor, without the inclusion of the word Black, tended to refer to somebody of African descent. It's a bit like the term African. The term African, if we use it now, tends to refer to people of color. However, there is an acknowledgement that there are white South Africans, white Zimbabweans, and people of Asian descent um, and other ethnicities part of the continent of Africa. But the presumption is, if one uses the word African, that you are referring to a person of color um, of a darker complexion. That tends to be the inference. And that's exactly the same inference that one would have with the word more. There would tend to be that inference unless the word was prefixed by another term such as white or tawny. Oh, and by the way, these are Moors playing the game of chess. Uh, chess is, was a popular game played by the Moors of the Iberian Peninsula because it was a game in which black fought white. <laughs> this is how they, they, they liked it. It was a game about ethnicity. Um, and it mirrored for many of them the conflicts that were taking place in the Iberian Peninsula between people of Moorish descent and those of European Christian descent in, in the northern parts. And so the game of chess was reintroduced into parts of southern Europe because of its popularity amongst the Moors. And the Moors also introduced many different things such as marzipan uh, and lots of other things too. Um, uh, but but we we'll, we'll, might have time to come to that later on. Yeah, so uh, let, let's move on a little bit. Um, I, I, what I want us to do now, so now you've got these sort of reference points. You've got these reference points. There are different terms that may be used to describe people of African descent, right? In early modern Europe, including in England, that it is possible for the Moors to be dark-skinned Africans, these key things. And it is also possible that the terminologies and the ideas that we have about Africans today, and we do, um, both conscious and unconscious, that some of those ideas may not be present in early modern European society or in English society. They had some of their own ideas. Okay, let, let us move on from that. In the Renaissance, a key feature of the Renaissance was to rediscover earlier ancient culture, including the early European ancient culture, and to incorporate that, uh, that European culture within a modern framework. So the Renaissance means to look back. It's often misunderstood, but it means looking back. Now, a key feature of what Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci and all these other people were doing, they were looking back at Greek, if we can use that word loosely to describe those, those states um, in, in what is now modern day Italy, looking back at the works of Plato and Socrates and Aristotle and Cicero and these people, and trying to understand what they were saying. However, many of the texts that these scholars, Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, and what have you had written, had been destroyed. They'd been destroyed during a series of cataclysms resulting from the destruction of the Western Roman Empire, um, the eventual destruction of the Eastern Roman, Eastern Roman Empire, Byzantium in 1453, so that the accumulated literary knowledge that we associate with the Renaissance, there was a dearth of scholars who could read um, uh, these texts or who could translate these texts. Ironically, the place where they went to, in other words, where European um, uh, intellectuals went to, to, to find out about um, classical Europe is a place that we may not think about or may not uh, assume uh, was a place where they would have come from. One of those places was North Africa. Another place was the Iberian Peninsula that you, you may actually assume. And, there is increasing knowledge now to prove that scholars from West Africa were heavily involved in translating um, texts. These scholars 
West Africa, North Africa, and the Iberian Peninsula, what we might loosely um, refer to as Moorish scholars. These scholars were involved in translating the ancient Greek and ancient Roman texts into languages, other European languages. And it is from those texts that English scribes then translated these works into English. I didn't understand this until I began to look at the text of the 16th century. Um, this text, for example, if you read it carefully, it says it is a text by Ptolemy. It's not actually by, well, it is by Ptolemy, but it's a translation. Translated from the Arabic into Latin. So it's telling us that it was first translated into Arabic. That's the ancient Greek into the Arabic. And then from the Arabic translated into Latin. And that this occurred, or certainly the publication of this text, occurred in Venice. So the Arabic writer, someone from either Asia Minor, who could write in Arabic, North Africa or West Africa, an Arabic scholar, a scholar that wrote in Arabic, has translated this ancient text and is helping to facilitate a process that was integral to the Renaissance. Just to show you this is not an exception. Uh, this work is by Aristotle, noted that it's called a doubtful or superstitious work. Um, and it says here that this was a Latin version, originally from the Arabic translation, so that the Arabic writer has translated it from its original tongue. You know, its original Greek tongue in this case. Good. There are many texts like this, many, many hundreds of texts that we have come to associate with the Renaissance. And they were translated often by African scholars, either African Moorish scholars or African scholars from, the con from, from uh, West Africa. I know that this is a difficult thing um, to absorb, so I'm going to continue to explain it in some more detail. The photograph that you see are texts. These are texts written from the 8th to the 16th century. These are the texts um, um, uh, written by African scholars, many of which are texts translating Aristotle, translating St. Augustine, who actually was also an African, but from North Africa, um, translating um, uh, the, 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 the um, works of um, Socrates, Plato, etc., etc. These texts, these texts that are here in this photograph are texts in a place called Timbuktu. Yes. Timbuktu is a real place. I know we often use the phrase from Timbuktu, uh, from here to Timbuktu and back again, as if it's some imaginary place like Prester John's imaginary, imaginary Lemuria. No, unlike Lemuria, unlike Prester John, Timbuktu was a real place, a real place of learning, a real place of learning, not just for the Islamic world, not just for West Africa, but for the world. So, these texts written by African scholars who were often polygots, multilingual people between the 8th and the 16th century were translating many of the texts, which later became translated into Italian, um, French and English, and which helped to kickstart the Renaissance. So what I'm trying to say is that the Renaissance is connected to African civilization and Africans and Europeans are inexplicably connected to each other in terms of the exchanging of civilization and that this has been going on for a very, very, very long period of time. Uh, this is um, uh, some of the texts and this is the curator of some of these texts uh, written, as I said, from the 8th century uh, to the 16th century. We must also remember that Timbuktu was, was a repository for at least three different African civilizations. So it contained texts that wasn't just the ideas of the European Renaissance, but also ideas of the African Renaissance, which is a subject beyond um, our, our discussion today. Okay, not only was the work in Timbuktu considered dangerous, it was considered dangerous by some Europeans, but it was in particular considered dangerous by the Ottoman Orthodoxy because they offered um, the capacity to research and translate works from whatsoever and whomsoever 
that knowledge was acquired from. In other words, knowledge that didn't conform to the strict Islamic scholarship that was coming out of the orthodoxy of the Ottoman Empire. And it is for that reason that in 1593, Timbuktu was put to the sword and many of these books and texts were destroyed. And it's also why um, uh, groups such as um, IS ISIL and others are trying to do the same thing um, now uh, in, um, in uh, Timbuktu. And, and ISIL and um, other affiliated groups are actively trying to destroy some of these texts, which are fundamentally important texts. So... The point is this, that we should not think of African or Africans or the Africans that arrived in Europe as being blank sheets of paper without knowledge, understanding or wisdom and without human capacity. The Africans that were coming to Europe, if they came from the literate, verbose and polygot societies, West African societies, North African societies, some of them would come speaking three or four or five different languages, including two or three European ones. Others would come with a rich cultural um, framework. We must remember, I think, and it's important, that Africa had not fallen under the control of European imperialism. Africans arrived in Europe as independent people for the most part, part of independent civilizations. There is a slight exception with what was happening in the Iberian Peninsula. That's slightly different. We, we might come to that today. That's slightly different. Moreover, people of African and Arabian descent, not only did they um, uh, arrive as intellectuals, academics, soldiers, um, and everything else within human experience, they also arrived as conquerors. In the 8th century, Gibril al-Tariq, that the Rock of Gibraltar is named after, in 711, he arrived in the Iberian Peninsula with an army of about 7,000 soldiers, 6,000 of whom were mostly North African and West African in origin. A small group were from Asia Minor. These people formed the original stock of the Moorish population, that was later added to um, by Abbasid, um, uh, peoples from West Africa, uh, etc. This initial population pushed through into the Iberian Peninsula. The representation of their pushing is still recorded. Please let us note that the Moors here are shown uh, in these um, uh, fantastic texts as African, that these invasions are shown by African. And uh, in other texts in the 14th, 15th, and 16th century, these people are unequivocally shown and depicted as Africans. We mustn't also forget that in the Song of Roland, which is supposed to be about, in a very fictional way, the invasion of people of African descent, um, Moorish descent, into not only the Iberian Peninsula, but into France, those people are described in the Song of Roland in a rather derogatory way, but unequivocally as Africans. Thank goodness for the lack of political correctness in that regard, because they describe them unequivocally as Africans. Unequivocally. In fact, the terms that they use is that their hair and that, that, their, com that their skin complexion is the same as their hair. You know? And these sorts of images that, we, that I've just been showing you describe a similar kind of iconographic representation. Uh, this also um, is of a similar kind of similar image. So these people arrived as conquerors. They subsisted and spread over various parts of Europe from the 8th century all the way through to the 16th century. In 1492, the last independent Moorish kingdom of Granada was conquered by Ferdinand and Isabella. Ferdinand and Isabella, of course, are the father and mother of Catherine of Aragon, who married Henry VIII. This is to show you that this history is inexplicably linked with English history. Spain then became a nation when it had conquered Granada. Portugal had slightly earlier when it had driven out its Moorish population or conquered its Moorish population. But the Africans didn't suddenly all disappear 
I know Boba Dill, the last king of, of Granada, did run, but many Moors remained, at least until the 1630s, when Philip III expelled the last Moors, uh, Moroscos, and converted Moorish people and their descendants who were still present uh, within Spain. Those Moorish people, between 1492 and the 1630s, some of those Moorish people began to travel to other parts of Europe, sometimes fleeing persecution from the Iberian Peninsula, some of them seeking you know, better opportunities as people do. They travel to France, where there in fact were other Moorish populations in places such as Aquitaine, Poitiers and Normandy, uh, but especially in Aquitaine. And they travel to other parts of Europe, including uh, Venice, the Venetian states, Mantua, um, and, they can, and they can be seen depicted in the Venetian state in Mantua uh, and in other parts of um, what is now Italy. They also traveled um, to, uh, in smaller numbers to parts of Europe, including Poland, etc., where they became part of the, the court, the court, um, the courtly nature of, of some of those societies, um, including in Poland um, um, and somewhat in, in uh, other places in Eastern Europe. But as a significant population, they became a significant population in what is now Holland, a significant population in what is now France, a significant population in what is now Venice or the Venetian state, a significant population, of course, in Spain and Portugal, and a significant population in England. Okay, we're going to talk more about this in a moment, but I just need to just attack another moment that maybe uh, we have some emotional attachment to. We have to move away from this idea of automatically thinking that the people of African descent would have automatically been thought of as negative, inferior, etc. This may be because either subconsciously or emotionally, these are the ideas that we have about Africans and that we have about blackness. You can have ideas about blackness and Africans and it might slightly be different. But in the early modern period, there are positive and negative ideas about Africans, and there are positive and negative ideas about blackness. The positive ideas and the negative ideas are jostling with each other in a field of ideas. Most often, the positive notions, certainly in the early part of the early modern period, are the most dominant. But undoubtedly, there are some negative ideas about Africans and negative ideas about blackness. Notice that I've separated the two into two separate camps. Good. I'm going to look just for a moment at some of the positive ideas about blackness, because I think that um, you may find them quite um, interesting. Uh, St. Morris was regarded and respected throughout early modern Europe. In fact, medieval and early modern Europe. St. Morris is often described as the patron saint of knights. Yes, I didn't misspeak. The patron saint of knights. Which is why knights in early modern and late medieval Europe often took St. Morris as their symbol. Here we have a statue of St. Morris, um, uh, which was standing over the grave of Otto I, the Holy Roman Emperor. Let us note that Otto I, the Holy Roman Emperor, was the most powerful man in Western Europe, um, as indeed the Holy Roman Emperors were. And we should look and try and understand why St. Morris, an unequivocally African representation of St. Morris, was standing over um, the grave of Otto I, because he was revered as a patron saint. But you might say, being cynical, being critical, as indeed I expect you to be, Oh, but this is just one representation. Yeah. Okay. This is another representation of St. Morris, um, uh, the legendary leader of the Theban Legion, who was put to death for not um, um, saving um, Christians in the Roman period and then venerated in Western Europe. St. Morris was, and St. Morris Day was the most popular holiday before St. Jo George's Day took over. And St. Morris Day used to be on April the 1st or the end of March, 
April the 1st. Please remember that because we're going to come back to this. This St. Morris was respected as an African, an unequivocally dark-skinned African, throughout Western Europe. This is an image um, uh, from Bohemia, just in case you thought it was just Western Europe. These are paintings, cropped paintings, to show you that representations of St. Morris are consistent. And often um, from, from the Iberian Peninsula, from Portugal, all the way to Poland um, and to the very steeps um, um, uh, uh, of Eastern Europe, do we get this continuous representation of St. Morris as an African. And just in case you were wondering, um, are there any representations of St. Morris as an African in England? Yes, there are. Um, in the St. Mary's Church in Ulfacombe in England, there is the representation of St. Morris um, as an African because it is consistent with this early modern European tradition that venerated this black saint. This is an early modern European tradition venerating this African. Uh, this is a uh, fantastic um, uh, painting by, by Matthias Grinwald. Um, showing St. Morris debating um, uh, with the Pope. This is a very important um, thing that I might just speak about, but not wax too lyrical about. <sighs> this is quite complicated. Stay with me, please. St. Morris is often shown as the pure representation. A pure representation that is in dispute with the pomp and popery that originates from Rome. And this is why St. Morris continued as an enduring image throughout the 14th, 15th, 16th, and early 17th century, because he offered a practical sacrifice for Christianity, rather than the pomp and circumstance that the church had become. As a warrior for Christ, he became a symbol of that physical fight, that physical sacrifice that's necessary for the religion to grow. And that's why he was adopted and continued to be adopted even by Protestant nations as they began to switch away from Catholicism. In fact, they begin to look at what North African scholars like um, St. Augustine were writing more strongly and if they used iconography they often looked at iconography such as his to push forward their agenda for change uh, this is a fantastic painting uh, from saxony uh, in, in, in modern germany um, showing saint morris and his companions let us note please that these are all people of african descent these are the theban legion who were put to death with him of course um, changed up for a 16th century audience, um, made into 16th century noble people, unequivocally noble, uh, unequivocally African. Yeah, this is another um, um, uh, painting uh, from the uh, 15th century earlier, from G also modern day Germany, showing um, uh, the um, the showing again that um, Saint Morris and the Theban Legion um, again in fine attire you know, fine noble attire, a representation of the divine in Europe and also part of the Renaissance. And this is another fantastic painting, also showing St. Morris and the Theban Legion. See that the individuals left and right are all gifted with menelin, especially those on the right, gifted with menelin, unequivocally African. I, in fact, I think nearly 80% are unequivocally African. Um, this is an important representation showing you that this idea was a constant idea throughout Western Europe. This is a, uh, another image of um, the saints, um, but this time the female saints. This is an image of the Queen of Sheba. Uh, we should perhaps note that she has long blonde flowing hair, but is unequivocally African because in 14, 15, 16th century theological texts, a strong vein supported the idea that she was unequivocally African. And the text of um, uh, the I am black but comely, you know, in the Song of Solomon was, whether we rightly or wrongly can link it to that, 
was often associated with that so that the metaphorical blackness that's suggested by I am black but calmly was suggested to be actual blackness and that this union between Sheba and, De and Solomon or Sheba and David they used to mix it up sometimes she married David sometimes she married Solomon that this mixture either produced the lineage that Prester John came from and therefore that Prester John was provided a gatekeeper to Lemuria and the Garden of Eden and that all of this kind of mythology was present in early modern Europe and this mythology supported a notion that Africans could be venerated, Africans could be symbols of divinity, Africans could be symbols of beauty. Okay let's move away from the Queen of Sheba into Balthazar. Balthazar is the name given, often given, to the Magi, the third Magi. Yes, Balthazar is the Magi in this rod screen that arrives last. I'll give you a close-up of him. This is a close-up of him. He arrives last, though. He is the last Magi to arrive. This um, uh, rod screen um, is from 1520, um, is in England. Um, and uh, to show you that this idea is also present. We might note, too, that he, for the sake of the times, is dressed in the most modern attire. He is a modern young king, and he arrives last. The Magi in, this, in the biblical story are the ones that come to adore the king. Sometimes they're talked, spoken about as three wise men. More often in the early modern period, they were described as kings. And the third one here is described and shown as being an African. Okay, this is a tradition. This isn't a one-off. Here we have Balthazar in Hieronymus Bosch's The Epiphany or the Adoration of the Magi. Please note that this um, um, uh, Balthazar also is incredibly young, fantastically young, and his daughter is even younger. Note that he is most fabulously attired, all in white, almost as if he is descended from, you know, the heavens, you know, a kind of illusion of the heavens. And please also note that he is almost a foot taller than the other kings. I know that they're kneeling down, but he's still a foot taller than them. He's enormous. And when you look at this painting, he looks so impressive. He looks more important than the baby Jesus, who is, looks rather, rather worse for wears in this painting. I <laughs> feel rather concerned about the, 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 um, this particular Jesus' his health. He looks quite um, um, worse for wear. Whereas Balthazar, and his daughter are these healthy, tall, noble people that you are immediately drawn to. In fact, you may look at the painting uh, and, and not even notice Mary uh, and the babe and Jesus there, but you are immediately drawn to this African and um, his daughter. You are immediately drawn to them. Can this be by chance? We've seen two representations so far. Okay, this one in Sweden. Again, we see. Um, the uh, Balthazar, he is last. He arrives last. Please, please note that he is beardless and unequivocally African. Yes, unequivocally African. And he's arriving last. This is not by chance. This is not by chance. Okay, we have another one just in case, you, you, just in case you thought that it was just with those images. This is from um, uh, Poland and also shows Balthazar arriving. And he is last. <laughs> the last to arrive and he's youthful and your eye is drawn to him now for a long time i i couldn't figure out why balthazar is the youngest and why he arrives last and i realized that this was not a, a, a negative statement it was a statement about the idea of the unblemished perfect black the unblemished and perfect black is a notion present within early modern society present in early modern Europe, the idea that blackness, the tincture of blackness, whether it was in the cosmos or whether it was represented in people of African descent whose complexion was similar to that blackness, that this substance, this aspect of the universe was in some ways perfect, more perfect or capable of being more perfect more, more capable of being unblemished, of not being able to show a blush, uh, um, as they say, not being able to blush. So it doesn't change color. 
it maintains it. Of course it does. But the idea is that it doesn't, that it's constant, that it's permanent. And there is also a notion that perhaps the people of Africa had not been touched yet by original sin. This is also an idea present in some early modern European texts. And this is why he's arriving last. Um, he is the youthful future of the church. He is a representation of that youth, of that energy, of that vitality, the untainted, unblemished, not deteriorated, not, not, this is the future. It's through him. Okay, so these symbolic representations and the imageries and, uh, and what have you um, uh, are, are symbolic, granted, right? Um, and we need to move away a little bit from that symbolic um, uh, imagery and, and into the real people of African descent who were present uh, in uh, early Tudor and Stuart society. One of them was Deirdre Joanqua. Deirdre Joanqua um, was the, one of the king's son in Guinea. I've kept all the original wording as it was written. Yes, a Guinea being a name given by Europeans to an indeterminate land space in West Africa. Yes, um, uh, Guinea, the, the country Guinea is named after um, this, but in fact, it doesn't necessarily mean when it's used in these early texts that this person is from Guinea-Bissau. So, but it does mean that they are from West Africa. So Deirdre Joanqua is... And this is this is just to discount the idea that you may have that the only African people who would be present in early modern Europe would be people that come from North Africa to show you that the intersectional nature of these societies is not perhaps quite what people have been um, uh, uh, giving a narrative um, out. It's more complicated than that. And to tell you that people of West African origin were certainly present inside European societies and people of West African origin were certainly present in North Africa and Asia Minor. But that's really a, another subject. So Deirdre Joanqua, um, uh, it says, was 20 years old and the son of Cadiba, king of the river Cestus in the country of Guinea. Yes, or the nation of, uh, or the region of Guinea. Cestus um, is actually a Portuguese word which it, it refers to the artifacts that were created in a certain region of Guinea or certain region of West Africa. So this river, Cestus is a name, was a name given to the river, but actually it, it, it relates to the artifacts that these people created. Now, Deirdre Joanqua in 1610 or 11, or 16, it's actually 1611, um, Deirdre Joanqua is baptized in an English church. He's baptized in St. Mildred's and Poultry in 1610. That's more than 411 years ago or 410 years ago. Why is Deirdre Dranka getting baptized in an English church? Politics, diplomacy. He's here as a result of West African ambassadorial overtures to English merchants and to the English aristocracy, including the English um, monarch. Why? West Africans were seeking European support, not only in conflict with each other, but to resist Ottoman incursion and to resist Spanish and Portuguese um, uh, colonialism. That's what they were mostly concerned about. At this, at this point in time, English and England and France had not become the major colonial powers that they later were to become. Another African dignitary of noble heritage was also baptized in England, in Tottenham, in All Hallows, in 1610. His name was Nossa Ananaberry. The word Nossa is written N-O-S-S-E-R, -S but in the African vernacular that it comes from, the West African vernacular that it comes from, is N-O-S-S-A or N-O-S-A. And Nossa is a type of king. I know it's used as a name now, but it is a type of king or a petty king, not the king of kings, but the king that sits next to the other king. <laughs> yeah. So it is the one, the, if you like, in a modern sense, the advisor who is next to the king. So Nossa Ananaberry um, um, uh, was the father of Walter Ananaberry, and Walter has got the name Walter as a result of his baptism in England. And he is also here as a result of the overtures. Now, 
These overtures are linked to a matter that I said earlier. Remember that I said that in 1593, the kingdom of Timbuktu was destroyed. Yes. And at that same time, another empire attached to Timbuktu called the Empire of Songhai was also destroyed. It was destroyed by um, uh, a Moroccan army being sponsored by the Ottoman Empire with the help of some English sailors and, um, uh, and English privateers. The destruction of Songhai in 1591 sent shockwaves throughout West African civilizations. This shockwave resulted, number one, in an arms race to acquire the gun and the cannon at the end of the 16th century, but also to acquire allies that could supply the gun and the cannon. Some of these West African dignitaries reached out to England and France, believing that England and France would not behave as Spain and Portugal had done, and that they could obtain the gun and the cannon from them. This is why we see West African dignitaries sending out their sons to England to be baptized at the end of the Tudor period and the beginning of the Stuart period. Okay, Let, let's go back to um, a little more iconography. So we've had two so far. We've had um, Balthazar and we've had St. Morris. These are two iconic representations that would be present inside early modern society where their blackness was celebrated. Okay, we now have a third. The third is Maurienne. Maurienne in the 15th and the 16th century was, um, according to the mythology, one of the black knights, I say one of, the black knights part of King Arthur's legendarium, what we often call in the matter of Britain, yes? Morien came from the Moorish lands. Uh, Morien um, was considered to be one of the most powerful knights of the round table. And the romance of Morien, written um, in France, typifies him as such. Morien is a constant figure in early modern European culture and often depicted in early modern European culture. Uh, we see him in 13th century romances, etc. Um, and he is described unequivocally as black. This is a, uh, an English translation um, from the romance of Moria. And we see here, he was all black, even as I tell you. His head, his body and his hands were all black, saving only his teeth. He shielded his armor, even those of a moor and black as raven, and etc. Et he was black with all. And so it goes on describing his blackness. It, it is unequivocal, <laughs> it's unequivocal that this is the person that's being described as being of African descent and firmly part of British legendarium and supported this, uh, this legendarium being constantly talked about in 15th, 16th century. This is an image of St. Morian from a German manuscript and this is a further image from Mantua um, of St. Morris I'm sorry, of St. Um, uh, Saint Morien, part of the Knights of the Round Table. Yes, uh, a 16th century Renaissance image of, of him. Yeah, good. Okay, let's go back a bit uh, um, using that Morien. It is interesting and remarkable that we see an African in Scotland called Peter the Morien who has taken on the moniker of Morian, to describe himself. And we now know that this African, when they took on that name, were trying to take on part of that legend or adopt that legend to themselves. So the, cho the choosing of the name isn't random. It has a historiographical footprint. So Peter the Morian was employed as an event planner as a drummer, as a musician, in Scotland, under King James IV of Scotland. King James IV dressed up as a black knight, or a wild knight, depending on, on what you interpret, and he serenaded an African woman in events called the Romance of the Wild Knight, or sometimes called the Black Lady Days. So let me just um, go back a bit, because I've said quite a lot. 
King James IV of Scotland takes on the moniker of a black knight, perhaps copying Morien or St. Morris or one of these other uh, legends, and serenades two women. These are two African women. These aren't European women dressed to appear as if they're African. They are two African women called Ellen Moore and Black Margaret. These are two African women who came from the Iberian Peninsula. They were brought to Scotland by Andrew Barton of Overbarton. And he brought these two women to Scotland. And they represented another aspect of the divine, another aspect of beauty and the romance as such. Um, not everybody, of course, shared the, um, the uh, liking of these uh, um, uh, women inside this Scottish court. And William Dunbar wrote a very satirical um, and derogatory play, uh, um, not play, but um, a poem called Anne Blackmore. Uh, which is extraordinarily derogatory, but we're glad for it because it unequivocally talks about the fact that this woman is of African descent. So these events, the Black Lady Days, etc., were part of a European tradition that Scotland was aping. Good. So Peter de Morian uh, um, uh, occurs continuously, his records can turn uh, continuously inside Scottish uh, records um, from 1503 all the way up to 1513. And, his, and payments by the Lord High Treasurer of Scotland are recorded as such. This is a reference to all the payments which I've um, um, uh, found. It's not all the reference to all the payments. In fact, there are many more than that. It's just to give you an indication that there are lots of references to lots of payments. Good. Let's move on. So this idea sort of leads us to uh, another notion, which is the kind of confidence that one may have in espousing ideas about um, ethnicity going backwards and the kind of confidence, misplaced confidence <laughs> that some people have when they feel that they can definitively define the ethnicity of England. This kind of confidence isn't present in the ideas as, as espoused by English writers and those writers who lived in England before the 17th century. This is a quote from the Venerable Bede, um, end of the 7th, beginning of the 18th, 8th century, says the original inhabitants of Britannia, whether indigenous or foreigner, like most other countries, unknown, he says. Which is Simon Sester and Richard Devices, um, uh, Richard Mulcaster also say something similar, um, as indeed does John Stowe, um, uh, the biographer and Raphael Holleshed later on, that the original inhabitants of these isles, talking about Britannia, England, whether indigenous or foreign, are like most other countries unknown. Note the similarity in the, in the quotation. This idea is also repeated by Francis Bacon in the 16th century. The original inhabitants of these isles, whether indigenous or foreign, like most other countries unknown. This is a commonly worn out phrase because these people are saying that they don't know who the indigenous people of, these, of this country are. And in a way, they might be saying that they are not. That it is so difficult to know who is. They are not claiming an ethnicity of indigenousness. They are saying that it is very difficult to know, that we might feel that we're superior to these people and that we can prove without a doubt who is indigenous, but we can't. We don't know. Some people say it's Anglo-Saxon. It definitely isn't that stock of people. And it isn't even the windmill people going back um, uh, further in time. It is very difficult to prove who the first or indigenous were. But these people are willing to own up to it. Of course, this kind of ambivalent, reflexive nature, this kind of ambivalence, reflexive aspect has to go by the end of the 17th and the beginning of the 18th century. You have to get rid of it. You have to get rid of it for definitive statements about your ethnicity, because if you're empire building at the end of the 17th and the beginning of the 18th century, you have to have a kind of ethnic confidence. A belief that your ethnicity or your race ha is indigenous and it has inherited, you know, um, uh, an authority and a right from its indigenous aspect to go to other places too. So these kinds of ambivalent, ambivalent reflective statements get forgotten for um, more monoethnic ones. So Africans have been part of the, an English narrative 
for a very, very, very long time. There were Africans from North Africa who came with the Celts between 800 BC and 450 CE. There are Africans that came with the Romans, 55 BC to the 5th century. There are Africans that came with the Vandals from, who came from North Africa in 450 CE with the Anglo-Saxons, um, Jutes um, and others from uh, what is they, now modern day France. There were Africans, of course, that came with Viking and Danish raiders from the 8th century onwards. Um, the, the Africans um, were portrayed constantly um, in medieval uh, and talk about medieval literature. We see evidence of their presence um, in the Doomsday Abravito in the 13th century. This African is hanging from the letter I. The Doomsday Abravito is not the Doomsday book, but the Abravito, a smaller version created in the 13th century. We don't know why he's holding on to the letter I, but we know he's unequivocally an African. This um, African knight um, uh, is here portrayed with an English, um, a white English lady. Um, we, we don't know quite the story behind it, but we know that this representation is there. This image we know a little more about. Um, the African is the one at the back, at the back of, or back of the elephant. Um, he is um, controlling the elephant here at the back. Here, I'm drawing a circle around him with my cursor. Yeah, because our minds might not be able to accept it. But then when we look again, we see there are some indications that this person is of African descent. When we compare his hair texture to the texture of hair texture of the others. This is a 13th century English way of depicting Africans. Without the biological determinist racial perspectives that we have. They're not downplaying the difference, but they're not emphasizing it either. Okay. Oh, yeah. And, and this, this goes on to another idea. There were elephants and there were lions and there were giraffes present in London, in England during the 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th century. How do we think that they got there? Did they walk? Did they swim? Did they fly? No, these elephants, giraffes, um, um, uh, lions came for the most part from North Africa, from West Africa and other places because there were these creatures present in some of these regions during this time. And they were brought with or by their, um, uh, their trainers and the, by their keepers. That's how they came to be in this country. And they came with their keepers and their trainers. Okay. Um, so, more than this sort of um, uh, um, uh, evidence that we've been talking about, there is also systemic, systemic um, volumes of evidence that talk about not just individuals who might come with elephants or lions or giraffes, not just representations such as St. Maurice and St. Maurien, but Africans living in England, married to white English people, part of English societies, communities, etc. This um, um, uh, record from uh, James Curry's um, marriage says James Curry's being a more Christian um, had married Margaret Person the Maid. Please let us note this. Um, it's very important. It says more Christian. He's not a Muslim Christian. That would be a paradox in two words. More here is a reference to the ethnicity that we were talking about before. And it again illustrates, as I said right at the beginning, that the word more doesn't necessarily relate to religion, but does to ethnicity. It's describing his ethnic origins, his ethnic roots. And he has married Margaret Person. So he has married Margaret Person and Maid. So this is an inter-ethnic union happening in 24, on 24th of December 1617 in London. So there is no prohibition. This is a key point. No prohibition against those inter-ethnic unions. Probably never has been um, in, in um, uh, English society, but that's also another matter. Uh, this, is from, this is to illustrate it's not just in London. In Plymouth, um, Helen, daughter of Christian, look at the word here, Negro. The word Negro began to be used by the middle part of the 16th century to refer to Blackamoors, to refer to people of African descent, mostly because of the Spanish influence. The word Negro means black, just like the word more. And here Helen is a daughter of Christian, the Negro servant of Richard Shear. We shouldn't conclude from this that all the people who are present in English society who are African are servants. But then even if they were, it doesn't necessarily mean that they have been precluded from other positions. But it is a representation of the fact that the vast majority of people 
were poor anyway and in service. So even if that was the case, it doesn't prove automatically that England was an automatically racially um, um, a governed society. It does mean that people of African descent were various different, uh, had various different status um, on, within English society. I've shown you already um, representations and explained to you about the, those African dignitaries. This is the other side to show you that Africans occupy various different status within English society. This is Joanne Pointing, the wife of Thomas Pointing, being a Blackamoor. The word Blackamoor actually relates to Joanne Pointing. Joanne Pointing is an African woman who's married um, Thomas Pointing, and now she's buried on the 13th day of September in 1603. So this is a grieving, a grieving husband for his wife, and, and she's just been buried in the churchyard in St. George's Parish in 1603. This is for Domingo, a black Negro servant to Sir William Winter. Um, William Winter, of course, a very powerful person within the English um, uh, Navy. Um, and he's he died of consumption. The, the, the fuller uh, reference is to Domingo being a Guinea Negario. Look at the changing in the words, but it's the same word referring to, you know, ethnicity. Being a servant to the right worshipful Sir William Winter, dwelling in the Abbey Place, East Smithfield. It's in London. Uh, this is a wonderful record for Simon Valencia, uh, being a Blackamoor, um, uh, uh, buried on the 20th of August, 1593. Uh, Valencia, of course, from Valencia in the Iberian Peninsula. And now you know um, why he was from Valencia. Um, and he was servant to Stephen Driffield, a needlemaker, Anne Vassy or Vasey, um, a Blackamoor wife to Anthony Vassy, trumpeter of the said country. Um, John Blank is not the only black trumpeter there are lots of trumpeters um throughout early modern europe of which he is only one um the, and this Anne vassy is a couple the said country probably implying that anthony vassy and vassy are both people who are black and moors so this shows a union or, or the burial of Anne vassy and this is a couple a couple of um uh two people who are both of african descent um uh, in um, uh, being buried in St. Botolph without all gate. Uh, this is a wonderful record for Mary Phyllis of Morosco. Mary Phyllis of Morosco being a blackamoor. She was of late servant one, Mistress Barker of Mark Lane. Look, look how the recorder has recorded not only her, but her father's name being Phyllis of Morosco, being both a basket maker and shovel maker. And then it says that she was 20 years old and that she'd been in England for 13 years. A lot of detail. It's a very long record, a very long record in the St. Butthoff without Allgate um, record. This is only a part of it. It's a very long record. In fact, it's the longest record for any commoner in the Memorandum Day book for St. Butthoff without Allgate. And, it, and then it repeats right at the end that Mary Phyllis A. Blackamoor, dwelling in Millicent Porter, etc., etc. It gives her both time and space and suggests that she is a woman cognizant these are not enslaved people, unless we would make them so. These are not enslaved people, unless we would make them so. So uh, this is um, a wonderful um, inscription, um, um, uh, anecdotally somewhat, um, from a African. Uh, his name, um, we do not know his name, uh, but it's a quote from um, William Harrison, 1577. And he says, um, Spanish needles were first taught in England by Eliza Grouse, a German, about the eighth year of Queen Elizabeth. And in Queen Mary's time, that's between 1553 and 1558, there was a Negro made fine Spanish needles in Cheapside, but would never teach his art to any. This is an African living in Cheapside in London, probably from Spain, but we'll come to that in a moment, who would never teach the art for making um, steel needles to anyone, but he was the first person to make steel needles in England, according to William Harrison. This idea is repeated. It isn't just William Harrison repeating uh, it uh, by Hayden Hayden's Dictionary. Needles were first made in England in Cheapside, London, in the time of Mary I, by a Negro from Spain, but was lost at his death and not recovered until 1566. And the Renekin Elizabeth just repeating the same thing and giving more explanation. So this African is an important person. Again, Thomas Fuller, 
in the 17th century, the beginning says, says, the first Spanish needles in England were made in the reign of Queen Mary in Cheapside by a Negro, but such is envy, as the phrase, that he would teach his art to none, so that it died with him. More charitable was he like. So this, I don't know whether the word more is a pun, it might be, um, but, but, but the point is that this African is important. He's important because the needle helped revolutionize the Don't industry. You know? We've got five minutes. Uh, yeah. well, well, a bit less. Um, okay. We've got a couple of questions for you. So could you could you wrap it up in a couple of minutes? We're of all course. fascinated. Sorry, I but we're, we're, we're ending at 8.30. So, okay, um, I'll, be, I'll be just five minutes. So, well, we need you. We sorry. We need you to wrap up. It's in. It's now eight twenty-three. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah, <sorry. laughs> yeah. Time goes when you're having fun, and we yes. all we all are. But if you can wrap up in in a minute, please, because there's okay, a couple good. of questions for you. Good. So uh, we ought to not. Uh, we ought to not um, uh, have a idea that um, the the concepts that we have about people of Africa African descent can be so simplified in our metonomic notions um, and we should be honest about our own prejudices and not presume that our own prejudices can be played back historically in time the um, the early modern period and the history of the early modern people is a complex history and it is not automatic um, that the um, negative ideas that we may place on it should automatically apply to it 